Well, good morning. Good morning. He is risen. Amen. What a joy it is to gather today on Easter Sunday morning uh, in the highest hopes of the gospel and the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to First United Methodist Church Midlothian. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston and Pastor April is over in our overflow space in the Family Life Center helping to lead uh, the people who are gathered here. So I'm going to say a warm welcome to all of you who have gathered here with us in person here and over in the Family Life Center and to those of you who have gathered with us online. We are so grateful that you're here with us today uh, and coming and celebrating our risen Lord Jesus Christ together. If you're with us online, we just encourage you to welcome one another in the comment section. And if you have any way that we can be supporting you in prayer, please let us know in that as well. Uh, to those of you who are first-time guests, we're so glad that you, you chose to come to worship with us on Easter morning. Uh, there is a QR code uh, up on the screen if you'd like to, to just share your information so that we could connect with you um, and let you know how grateful we are that you have joined us today. Online, you can follow the link in the comment section there as well. Um, but what a joy we get today to come and express the hope that we have in Jesus Christ of not only a life today, uh, but a life that continues even in the face of death. And we thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, and we're going to open with a word of prayer. Jesus, you are alive and you are here. And that is enough for us. And we pray that you would be glorified as we come to you with words of praise. For this we offer in your great and holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand together and sing. Easter people, raise your voices. with many crowns.
affirmation of faith this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6, and Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Now let's affirm our faith together. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, and whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross, reconciles all things to God. Amen. you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Risen and glorious Lord, in the word you tell us that your mercies are new, and that is never more true than on Easter morning, where we gather here underneath the amazing reality and truth that you, Jesus, are Lord over sin and death and all creation. For today we celebrate the news of the angel who says you are looking for Jesus. He is not here. He is risen. 
We thank you, Jesus, for the victory that you have won, that we can come here under the amazing truth that you shared this victory with all who would come to you. That as you stand triumphant over the chains of sin and death, so do we who are in you. We thank you for such a hope. For we are reminded on a daily basis of our need to hope in something greater than we see. And so we come placing our hope in you, a living Savior who is seated at the right hand of the Father and continuing to work in the world today till it is redeemed to the glory of God the Father. We pray that the hope of your resurrection would pierce the hearts of all who hear the good news today. That we would leave with hearts lifted up as we are aware of who you are and all that you continue to do even as we worship. We are grateful that we can be a people of hope and joy no matter what our circumstances are in this life. And we pray that we would stand tall in who you are with great assurance of the life that we know only through you. One of the ways in which we acknowledge you and celebrate you, Jesus, is by praying the way that you taught us to pray. And so we together as a church pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Uh, boy, nothing beats Easter morning hymns. Uh, don't tell the contemporary crowd I said that. So it's, uh, that'll be our, our little secret. Uh, um, so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> You know, sitting up here, I, I realize that about every year I'm reminded that I have a, a slight allergy to lilies. <laughs> so if you see any, you know, let, let, give me a warning, please. Um, <laughs> but will power will prevail. Uh, if Jesus can prevail over the grave, uh, then, then we too shall make it. Uh, today we're looking at the story of the disciples' journey on the road to Emmaus. And it really is, if you've been reading through Luke's gospel with us as a church, it really is one of the most beautiful stories in Luke's entire gospel. And it's a story of, of two disciples and their experience with the risen Jesus. And so let's hear the story beginning in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still with their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know these things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared immediately from their sight. Then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Oh, 
this is a truly beautiful story, and as we read through it, I imagine you, you gathered some of the significance to the story itself, and there's a number of things we'll look at in the sermon today. But really the chief theme here in the story on the road to Emmaus is that it is a journey to a new vision of Jesus. You could say that it's a journey to a, a vision of the true Jesus. Because when we find the disciples on the road making the journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey, we find them with an old vision of Jesus. And it's one of tragedy. You know, their last image of Jesus was one of him being beaten and shamed and crucified. It was an image of Jesus' body being peeled off a cross by the Romans, you know, hastily wrapped and placed in a tomb. This was the vision of Jesus that these two disciples had as they made their way. It was a vision of tragedy. And since it was Easter, they needed a new vision of Jesus. And who better to give them a new vision than Jesus himself? We're told that Jesus joins them on the journey and, and begins to talk with them. And, and, and there's this interesting part of the story when it says they were kept from recognizing him. Now, this is more than just they weren't looking for a dead guy to be alive kind of a thing. Uh, there's this, you know, imp it's implied that there's this kind of divine action that shielded their eyes from seeing Jesus as he was in that moment. And this is rather curious to us, but we see that it's kind of common as we go through the gospel narrative. We see that time and time again, Jesus tells people not to tell people of their experience of him. We've already seen this a number of times in Luke's gospel. We see in Luke 5 when Jesus heals a leper and then he says to him, don't, don't tell anyone what I've done for you. We see it in Luke chapter 9 when, when Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes his great confession. He says, I believe that you are the Messiah of God. And Jesus says, you're right. But keep it to yourself. And we hear this, and this is confusing because we think, isn't this counterintuitive to what Jesus is trying to do? Isn't he trying to get the message out there? Why is he asking them to conceal his identity? Well, the answer for those stories, I think, is the same uh, for this one. And it's that they don't have the good news yet. You see, they don't understand fully who Jesus is or what he has come to do. I mean, surely the leper knew that Jesus had come to heal him, but that's as far as his story went. And even Peter, who says that Jesus is a Messiah, has no clue in Luke chapter 9 the extent of what God was going to do in Jesus Christ. Because what becomes evident to us is that it isn't until the resurrection that Jesus' followers have a complete picture of who he is and what he has done. And so anything that they may say before that is incomplete. And we see a great example of that in, in Cleopas' reply when Jesus asked him about what things they were talking about on the road. I mean, Cleopas gives them insight into, well, Jesus' own, own life. Uh, but, but you notice maybe that, that it's missing something. When he replays the events, here's what he says. He talks about Jesus' life. He talks about his teachings, his works. He talks about the cross. He even talks about the possibility of resurrection. But what he misses is the reality of the resurrection. 
And there's a tremendous difference between the possibility of resurrection and the reality of Jesus' resurrection. You know, Luke Timothy Johnson in his book, uh, Living Jesus, makes this kind of obvious, but, but at the same time kind of profound point. Uh, he opens his book with this statement. He says, it makes a big difference whether we think someone is dead or alive. And that seems a little amusing, but it's so true. It makes a really big difference whether we believe someone's dead or alive. And this is what we see in Cleopas and the other disciple. When Jesus meets them on the road, their faces were downcast. And they're left in a state of despair. And then we hear this in verse 21. And Cleopas says to Jesus, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Had hoped. As in hope was past tense. As in last Sunday when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, we we had hopes that he was going to come as the new Moses to deliver Israel finally from, from the grip of their captors. But all those hopes that began this last week, they came crashing down on Friday because they never saw in all the hopes that they had for Jesus a cross or a tomb. And this is where all of Jesus' followers are hung up on at this point in the story. You see, not one of them could reconcile Jesus' teachings and his works with how he died. They had no way of, of having that make sense to them. They never envisioned Jesus suffering on their behalf. And this is really the heavy part of the story here in Luke 24, but it's at this point where the beauty of the story begins to emerge. Because this is when Jesus begins to speak into their despair. And there's a truth here hidden in a story that Jesus always speaks into our despair. That Jesus is the one who intercedes for us and prays for us. Who speaks into our hurt, into our pain. And Jesus speaks into their despair by opening their eyes to the scriptures and the way that they point to him. He does by filling in the gaps to make sure that they begin to understand. And since it was that they couldn't see how Jesus had to suffer, Jesus takes the narrative of the cross and the resurrection, and he opens their eyes to how all of the scriptures point to this as a necessary thing for God's redemptive plan of salvation for the world. What Jesus shows them is that the entire arc of the Old Testament points not just to a king who would come on behalf of God, but it points to one who would come as a suffering servant first, who only then would be raised as a new and glorious king. And so Jesus shows them in the scriptures where he is. And it's, it's John Calvin who does a masterful job of showing how the Old Testament scriptures point to Jesus. In a preface he wrote to a, a French version of the New Testament in 1535, I want you to listen to how he reviews the Old Testament in light of what we know of Christ. He says that he, meaning Jesus, is Isaac, the beloved son of the father who was offered as a sacrifice, but nevertheless did not succumb to the power of death. He is Jacob, the watchful shepherd, who has such great care for the sheep which he guards. 
He is the good and compassionate brother Joseph, who in his glory was not ashamed to acknowledge his brothers, however lowly and abject their condition. He is the great sacrificer and bishop Melchizedek, who has offered an eternal sacrifice once and for all. He is the sovereign lawgiver Moses, writing his law on the tablets of our heart by his spirit. He is a faithful captain and guide, Joshua, to lead us to the promised land. He is a victorious and noble King David, bringing by his hand all rebellious, rebellious power to subjection. He is a magnificent and triumphant King Solomon, governing his kingdom in peace and prosperity. He is a strong and powerful Samson, who by his death has overwhelmed his enemies. You see, Jesus takes the scriptures on that road and he opens the eyes of the disciples to where they could see him on every page. And in light of the cross and the resurrection, the things that didn't make sense before begin to make sense. That a sacrificial system who had been practiced for thousands of years was insufficient. And that maybe it was pointing to a greater sacrifice. That the temple, a place of God's presence that had been taken from them, was perhaps more than a place, but found in a person. You see, all of a sudden for them on that road, things that didn't make sense began to make sense. It was Jesus' suffering, his death, and his resurrection as revealed in the word that became the foundation for their new vision of Jesus. But even then, it isn't until Jesus does one thing that they see him for who he is. It isn't until they come to a table and Jesus takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it that they see him. We're told the moment they recognize him, they begin to remember Jesus' words. And Luke doesn't tell us which words they remember. Could very well be the words that Jesus shared in Luke chapter 9 when he said, The Son of Man must suffer, be killed, and on the third day be raised from the dead. Could be the words from John chapter 6 when Jesus says, I am the bread of life who gives life to the world and anyone who comes to me will not go hungry. Or it could be the words that Jesus shared at a table just a few days before where he spoke in the clearest terms of what his death meant. that he was the bread. The blessed one who'd come from the glories of heaven to us with his body broken that the chains of sin and death might be broken in us and that the life he would take up would be given to all who love him. Whichever words it was, it was when Jesus broke the bread that their eyes were open to who he was and a new vision of Jesus began to emerge. And it wasn't a vision of tragedy, but one of triumph. It wasn't a vision of, of Jesus suffering at the hands of the Romans. It was a vision of Jesus choosing to suffer laying down his life for you and for me, only to take it up again in glory. 
It was a vision of the words of John the baptizer who said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was a vision of the words that Paul would come to share of Jesus as the beginning of God's new creation, the firstborn from among the dead, the one who holds all things together, and the one who reconciles all things unto himself, both things in heaven and on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It is a vis vision of Jesus, the living one who died and behold is alive forevermore. This is the vision they have of Jesus as he breaks the bread. And we see in the text that it wasn't lost on them in the significance of when that vision occurs. That the conjunction of, of having the breaking of the bread and the new vision of Jesus there at a table was an invitation into Jesus' resurrection life. That the victory Jesus won over sin and death is a victory he shares with all who love him. Who come to Jesus willing to die a, the death of a life apart from him in order to be raised to a life with him. It was a life that Jesus points to in John 10.10 10 when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full I love the way C.S. Lewis talks about this life that's in Jesus. He talks about it as a life that is always expanding. That just when we think we've hit the ceiling of what our peace and joy and hope can look like, it just begins to get bigger. That the life we're looking for, the life that is truly life, is found in Jesus Christ. This is what they see there at the table. We're told as soon as they realize who they have seen, that immediately they get up and they make the journey back to Jerusalem. And they go to their brothers and sisters to tell them the story that they'd seen to release them from their hopelessness. Because the news of all they had learned was just too good not to share. I pray that this Easter morning we would be so compelled to go and tell the story of the hope that we have in a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you join me in praying? Jesus, we pray that the vision those two disciples received of you and all your glory that Easter afternoon would be our vision of you. That in seeing the reality of the resurrection, we would be lifted from despair in this life to victory not claimed by any tragedy, but living in triumph because of who you are and the fact that you are a living Lord of all creation. We thank you for the hope that we can have hope in the face of this world, of all that's going on in this world. And we pray that that hope would be ours today as you are ours. We thank you and we praise you for all the glory belongs to you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together as we sing in the garden.
Amen. What a joy it's been to worship together here today. Um, I want to share with you just a little, a uh, few of announcements here. We have um, some great things to celebrate. Uh, this past week as a church, we've been uh, trying to bless our community and find ways to do that here. And we were able to provide meals for all of our first responders and our fire department and police. Uh, and so we're uh, great to get to share those meals with them today. And uh, this in two weeks, we'll be providing sonic drinks for the staff of J.R. Irvin, Frank Seal, and MHS. So uh, just a way to bless them on their day off uh, and hopefully lift their spirits a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's, it's giving uh, that your gifts to the church that really empower this kind of generosity and opportunities to serve our community. And so I want to thank you for uh, your faithfulness and giving that's allowed us to do these things and more. Uh, if you're online, you can follow a link to give uh, and those of you who are here there's plates as you exit uh, to make a gift and uh, we'll continue to use those to bless our community in the name of Jesus Christ uh, for uh, those of you who are members we have a, a kind of in-house announcement here uh, we have a church conference meeting scheduled for April 18th uh, and we will be voting on something of which you'll receive more information in this week uh, via email. Um, but we'll be voting on the sale of our two parsonages uh, to pay off debt. Uh, and so it's a kind of an exciting thing for our church. And so you'll hear more about that in an email to come. Uh, so be looking for that. But, but note that date uh, of April 18th. That's two weeks from today. Uh, for that meeting. Uh, for first-time guests, we're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, again, we want you uh, to make sure that you're just welcomed, and uh, we're so grateful you're here, whether you're in person or online. Uh, we're so thankful you came. Uh, in fact, we have a gift for you today. Uh, we just got some T-shirts made hot off the press from Rally. Uh, and so if you're a first-time guest, members, this does not include you, all right? So um, we love you, but hey, uh, we love our, our guests, too. So if you're a first-time guest, you can stop in the back. Uh, there's a table with some T-shirts there and tell them your size. We have sizes for the whole family. And so uh, you're welcome to grab a shirt. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, use a QR code uh, just to help us connect with you, we, we'd sure appreciate that. Um, but what a joy it is to gather here today. Uh, what a joy it is to have a new vision of Jesus, not one of defeat but, and despair, but one of great victory, uh, of a living and risen Savior who is our Lord today and who continues to have victory over any enemy. Um, and so we pray that we go from this place with the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ on our hearts, compelled to share the story with a hurting world out there. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 